Toss aside the touchy-feely notions of love in business and recognize the real power it holds. Welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast with host Steve Farber, drawing on his work with a wide variety of companies from the Fortune 100 to smaller family-owned businesses. Farber shares inspiring interviews with business leaders and proven strategies for how you can create experiences that your customers will love by developing a culture that your employees, teammates, and colleagues love working in. Discover why and how love at the end of the day is just a damn good business for you too. Here's your host, Steve Farber. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. I am your host, Steve Farber, and today I'm going to bring you a wonderful uh, presentation from the CEO of an iconic company called American Greetings. Uh, if you haven't heard of them directly, you've absolutely experienced their products. They're this greeting card company, thus the name American Greetings. Uh, they've been around for over 100 years. Uh, they have about 25,000 employees. And John Beter, uh, at the time of this recording, was the president and CEO. He has since retired. Now, here's here's the backstory on this. He, uh, I'm sharing this presentation from our extreme leadership experience and he rocked the house he took the stage he rocked the house he told the american greeting story he explained how love is really a big part of what they do you're going to hear all about it in just a few minutes and afterwards i was talking to one of his folks who was actually in the audience and i said john killed it he was amazing and the response that i got was Yes, he did. He is so inspiring. We are going to miss him so much. And I said, I said, what do you, what do you mean you're going to miss him? He said, oh, didn't you know he's retiring next week? I, I, was, I was gobsmacked. I couldn't believe it. So I, 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 I found John and I said, John, why didn't you tell me that you're, that you're leaving? And he said, I didn't want anybody to know because I didn't want this talk to be about me. I wanted it to be about the company. I wanted the attention to be there. So that's my man, John Beter. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he joined American Greetings in 2008 as senior vice president. Uh, he was uh, the sales and marketing executive, you know, the chief. John joined American Greetings in 2008 as senior vice president, executive sales and marketing officer. He led product sales, marketing efforts for North America. And he actually, at once upon a time, worked at uh, Hallmark Cards, which of course is, is you know, what we uh, consider to be, you know, the, the great rivalry, Hallmark and American Greetings. Uh, but he and the head of Hallmark are actually very close friends and worked together in the past. Uh, so he's been in the greeting card industry for more than 30 years. He's very passionate about it. And when he decided it was time to, uh, to move on, it was simply because he was ready for, uh, for focusing on his family. Uh, he was really on a roll. American Greetings was doing great. And he just decided it was time to move on. So we were really fortunate to have him uh, present this great American Greetings story to us. And I'm thrilled to be able to share it with you today. So here he is. My friend, and soon to be yours, John Beter. Enjoy. Can I ask a couple questions? How many folks here are certified coaches? Okay. How many folks here are like from businesses who have to help their business implement a lot of these concepts? How many folks here are executives who uh, just accidentally came in here instead of going to the Rotary meeting this morning? <laughs> <laughs> I did, by the way. I accidentally went to the Rotary meeting. <laughs> um, so how many of us are coaches? I think we all are in some form or fashion. And what I've learned at American Greetings is to, to do this right, to get the culture right, everyone in the organization has to be a coach, a coach in, in, the, in, in their own way. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, I have the opportunity to lead a greeting card company. Uh, we do about $2 billion worth of greeting cards and other stuff a year at about 50 cents a piece, right, Melissa? 
So that's a lot of greeting cards. We operate uh, all over the world, Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Europe. Uh, we, we sell everywhere. We have 17,000 associates. That's going to be important in my conversation. And um, uh, the first thing you have to realize when you have a role like mine is 17,000 associates means nothing can be about me. Nothing can be about our management team. It has to be about the people who work for our company because if it's not about them, we're not gonna get everyone aligned against a common goal. Uh, my goal simply is I wanna work for the best company I can. And I have devoted my entire career to making every company I work for the best possible company it can be. And we have applied a lot of tools to that. We are a communication company. I hope you get that feeling when I'm done with my presentation today. How do you get people rallied around something? And I'm going to tell you there's not a magic formula. It's just a lot of sweat, a lot of hard work, some effort, and trust. you got to trust this idea of love. Um, so I met Steve, what, seven, eight months ago now? OK. Yeah, we were in Orange County. Um, I'll, convince, I'll, I'll, I'll confess immediately that I am a former non-believer in this stuff, OK? I am like a hardened financial operational accounting executive. Right, Brian? Brian knew me in a previous life. I'm a trained journalist. I'm the son of a journalist. And the one thing I inherited from my father more than anything else is a real, real intense BS detector, OK? Just, I, I'm instantly on guard, OK? Defensive, like, like Andrew said. And I used to believe that business was about profit, productivity, ROI, ROA, ROU, RO me. That's what I thought business was about. You get it. Well, I'm going to tell you a story here in the next 50 minutes. And it's a story about a journey. And it's a story about how our company did the journey just getting Steve's help in the last uh, seven or eight months. We're actually going to bring Steve and his team back in again because we're looking for the next leg of our journey. We needed something to kind of accelerate us into the second stage of our rocket ship ride. And so uh, we're, we're going we're to begin working with Leap to do that. Back to Steve for a minute. So, so how I met Steve, I would have never met Steve if I hadn't had like a very uncomfortable meeting uh, at our headquarters in Cleveland. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, that uncomfortable meeting was, uh, I was just you know, casually talking about our upcoming sales meetings, and the head of our field organization told me that we were going to have a keynote speaker who was going to talk about love in business. And it was like, I, I, you know, sometimes it was after lunch. You know, when you're after lunch, you kind of miss things occasionally. I said, what did you say? And he said, we're going to have a keynote speaker who's going to talk about love in business. And my first thought, I swear, was, why are we having a sexual harassment seminar at our sales meetings? <laughs> But what I learned was uh, it is the same thing that we have been trying to do. We're still on our journey at American Greens that we've been trying to do for the last 10 years, which is finding our purpose. We talked about the why earlier this morning. I want to talk about that in some detail. Helping people find meaning in their work. OK, I am um, going to make an assertion here. Uh, having sat through the morning, I, I think that this is the beginning of a very important movement in business. I think you guys do too. I think it is the embryonic part of that, and I'll share a couple of reasons why as I talk in the next 50 minutes or so. And I think that this is going to be the 21st century version of productivity. Back to my hardcore operating thing. I think this is how you get productivity in the 21st century workforce. Every company is going to have a different answer because we're all different. We all do different things. But it's all going to come from the same kernel, the same core. And I think that what is going to make a boring 20th century business like greeting cards hip in the internet era of the 21st century are all the concepts that you guys are talking about here. And I'm going to show you how we apply them at American Greetings. So. I listen, I go to Steve's presentation. I am thoroughly impressed. I love the Warren Buffett quote, by the way. I don't want to hire people who love money. I want to hire people who love their business. And if they don't love their business, I don't want their business. I think that is so true. That is Warren talking about purpose and people understanding their purpose. You see, our culture is basically, life's too short. OK, earlier this morning, we said, you know, what do we spend? Like 2,000, 2,500 hours a year in our jobs, OK? That's an awful lot of time to spend doing something that you don't like, 
okay? And if you don't like it, you're not going to be productive, you're not going to be engaged, you're not going to do your job near as well. Frankly, you're wasting your time and you're wasting the company's time. There's a commercial reason to do this, but it's all rooted in the best of intentions. And if you can make both those things line up, your company is always, always going to win. Okay, I'm Steve's age, okay? I'm like 92. And um, <laughs> Um, I'm going to digress for a minute because in my 30-some years in business, I've come to learn a couple of things and believe in a couple of things that if you told me I believed these 30 years ago, I'd have told you I was crazy. I believe in karma. I believe in coincidence. I believe in happenstance, and it all happens for a reason. And you make your own luck. If you treat people well, they will pay it forward back to you. They may not do it the next day. They may not do it on an ROA basis. You may not get your ROI out of it, but good things will happen. OK, uh, I'm a reader. I'm a, um, a browser. I am a uh, lurker on the internet. OK, I'm one of these guys who has a Facebook page but never posts, but reads all my friends' posts. You know those guys? OK. Um, and I was uh, prowling on the internet yesterday, and of all places, the New York Times has decided that your movement, our movement here, is really important. If you read the New York Times Magazine this Sunday, they will have a, con a long article on the future of work. And I was reading it yesterday as I was flying out here, and I said, that is a coincidence. Or is that happenstance? Or is that karma? Let me tell you a little bit of what they said. It was, a it was written by a Harvard Business School alum who was 15 years out of school. He had just gone to a reunion, and he was talking about his classmates' professional development. They left Harvard Business School thinking they had it made. We're all going to make a million dollars. We're all going to make a fortune. Um, and after he talked to his classmates after 15 years, what he walked away understanding was many, if not most of them, had no sense of accomplishment. They were just making money, and the money had trapped them in unpleasant jobs. Many of them told them they were wasting their lives. Quote, if you spend 10, 12 hours a day doing work you hate, no paycheck should be big enough. Think about that. If you do 12 hours a day of work that you hate, no paycheck is big enough. That is what's wrong with American capitalism, OK? And what's right about American capitalism is there's going to be a whole array of companies that are going to emerge in the next 15 or 20 years. Yes, they're going to be environmental, but they're not just going to be environmental. Yes, they're going to be with a purpose, but not just a purpose. Yes, they are going to have great new products and services, but they're going to operate around a new value system. And that value system is going to emerge in the next 10 to 15 years. And I can tell you why, because the old way of managing kills productivity. It kills the spirit of an organization, and it kills your business momentum. All three at once. You heard a story about it this morning. Mitch, you had to undo all of that because the momentum in your business had been destroyed, OK? And you probably just feel like you're getting your legs behind you, underneath you right now. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm a sales guy. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. Let me tell you what I'm going to tell you, OK? <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about change. And Andrew's comment about fear and change are the same thing. It's all this change in the world that is creating all the fear. All the change that's happening in the world is creating all this fear. The organizations that win are going to be able to manage that change. That's what I come, came in thinking. I'm leaving saying all the organizations are going to be able to mitigate that fear. I'm going to talk to you about finding a purpose and how we found our purpose. I'm going to show you some stuff I think you've seen before, but I want to put it into a different context because I want to talk to you about how we communicate this message to 17,000 people. I'll tell you a little bit about my company, American Greeting AG's Journey. I'm going to try to knit that together for you. I'm going to show you a couple of truly remarkable outcomes that have embedded this concept in our organization for the next 50 years. And then, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how this purpose is going to defeat all the change that we are fighting in the marketplace. Does that sound like an agenda? Yeah. OK. OK. And I'm going to break this up. I do have some videos. It's just not going to be uh, PowerPoint slides. My, my, my team from AG who is here, I'm famous. I hate PowerPoints, OK? I've gotten out of meetings, for but there's no other way to communicate some of this. So bear with me here. OK. OK. Motivating business transformation. I hate language like that, so I put it up there on purpose, OK? <laughs> and I'm on A. There we go. Transformation, OK? Isn't that a like 21st century business word, OK? What does that mean, OK? Well, 
So there are three ways people learn. Did you know that? Some people learn by seeing, some people learn by reading, and some people learn by hearing. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do a little bit of each because I think I've got some of everybody in this room. So some slides I'm not even going to do except put up, and if you're a reader, you can read them because you'll be interested in that. I'll just describe what's going on. Transformation, a thorough or dramatic change in form or appearance. How many people work with companies that that has happened to in the last five years? Okay, that's more than two out of three, right? Okay. And then you can see all the synonyms. synonyms. I love all the synonyms. Being a journalist, I'm into dictionaries. I still have one on my desk. Okay, I love this slide. I use this all the time. This is my code language for, okay, brace yourself, guys. Something, something crazy is about to happen. I've done this when we've done reorganizations. This slide goes up. It's kind of like my billboard, okay? So there's change ahead, guys. Okay. I hate some of the language in the American media right now. I think they uh, use it and uh, they devalue uh, the language. Okay, exponential. How many times do you hear exponential? You know what exponential really means? Unbelievable, I can't even hear the word anymore. If you take 30 linear paces, you're gonna go 30 meters, did you know that? You take 30 exponential steps, you're gonna go 26 times around the worth. I don't think people understand what exponential means. <laughs> However, I do think for many people, they feel like there is exponential change happening in their world, in their jobs, with their families, with their kids. I don't recognize the education my kids are getting right now. I don't, okay? Um, really, we don't teach math anymore? Okay, um, and I think a lot of us are feeling like there's exponential change going on around us, and I think the exponential change equals the fear, because that creates uncertainty, and you don't know if you're going 26 times around the world in 30 steps what the heck's happening. You're going awfully fast, and I think it's getting too fast for people. I think you can build organizations. I think you can coach leaders like me who don't get it, okay, who didn't get it, I think you can coach them. If you hit them appropriately in the right places with the right logic, you can coach them into behaving better. Okay, that's the disruptive stress opportunity. That's another way of looking at exponential versus linear. The average lifespan of a company listed in the S&P 500 is it decreased from 67 years in the 20s to 50 years today. I don't believe that. I think it's less than that. For 10 years, it's predicted that 40% of the future 500 companies will no longer exist. I don't believe that. I think it's less than that. Here is the largest US companies in the United States, 2008 versus 2018. I'll let you look at that for a minute. I'm surprised, I'm not surprised. Isn't that interesting? I am telling you, the top five in 2018, Maybe one of them will be around in 2028. Hard to imagine. But they're going to systematically explode in something else. That's what exponential change means. Can you imagine living in a world like that? Well, that's the world we live in. So we've got to give a tether to our people who work in our organizations so that they know they have a purpose in what they're doing. Because things are changing so fast, you'll lose track of what you're doing almost every, every minute of every day. Here's another way to change. Okay, so I had the privilege of working with the Kodak guys when they were just starting with digital photography, and this was like in the early 80s. The first digital camera, did you see that? That's it. I've met Steve, by the way. He's an interesting cat. Uh, $10,000 for that first digital camera, okay? This is the digital camera everybody has now. More pictures are taken on these than Kodak did in the 10 biggest years combined of when they did film. That's how the, that's exponential change, okay? And what happened to Kodak? Can you imagine inventing the digital camera and going out of business? These guys co-opted it. That's because they had a different purpose. They knew what their purpose was. Kodak lost track of theirs. They didn't see the exponential change coming. More on that in a minute. Nearly two out of three CEOs and CFOs anticipate business model change due to the digital business. I look at that and I immediately ask a question. What's wrong with that one out of three? <laughs> I 
I love this. I show this uh, every chance I get. Everyone thinks Darwin has this idea of evolution that's about strength or the most intelligence. It's not. It's about adaptation. If you are going to survive, you're going to adapt. And that's not the CEO of a company adapting, nor is it his board of directors, nor is it, is it ownership. It is about the rank and file. It's the people, the associate, we call them associates at American Greetings. It's the associates of the company. They're the ones who are going to have to adapt. The question is, what is going to tether their adaptation to what their core purpose is, and what are they going to adapt to? And it only works if they do the adaptation. I can't do it from my office. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we did that. OK, I only look back because history is a very interesting uh, teacher. But if you get totally rooted in your history, you're going to fail. Every day is the intersection between the past and the future. And you get, every day, you get a chance to reinvent yourself. And if you take that opportunity, you might be able to keep pace. OK, so this is the slide that I think um, Andrew had a much better one. The, 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 the survive and thrive chart, that's what this is trying to explain. This is like too much business school language. Okay, I loved his, okay? In fact, I might try to borrow his at some point. So, um, but if you have a growth mindset, what you're basically doing is you're saying, I might be able to transform my business because I'm trying to make it something different and I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to meet new needs. If I'm fixed, I'm basically worried about all the stuff that I'm throwing away and I'm trying to keep as much as I can to protect my investment. Okay, what I love about this group is I think I've heard at least 40 stories today. Stories is the way that you can communicate and motivate people and get them tethered to your purpose. So I'm gonna tell you one. So I joined American Greetings about 11 years ago, and I was a, a, a member. I had joined a very broken industrial company of the early 20th century, OK? We hadn't evolved at all. We, 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 were, we were just basically running on fumes, OK? And the chairman of the company had asked me to join because he knew I had some controversial ideas about business, OK? And uh, he hired a guy at the same time who was the last of Sam Walton's protégés. Walmart had long evolved by this point, and Sam was long gone. He'd been dead for 15 years. But his protege came in, and he sat for two years and listened about our business. And after two years, he uh, spoke up one day, and he says, you know something? Um, I think maybe I can help now. Oh, good. Um, whenever I visited a company, the one thing that I always looked for when I bought products from a company for Walmart is I always evaluated what I called the smell of the place. And in five minutes, you can figure out a company by the smell of the place. It's how it looks. It's how its people act. It's whether they smile, uh, a million little things. But it's from practice, he could figure that out. And he said, I think American Greetings can adjust its culture if we can change the smell of the place. Now, the chairman of the board said, you think the place smells bad? <laughs> um, and so he took us away, the management team, for a day, and we had a day-long seminar where we just talked about culture, what Walmart did, how that might be able to help American Greetings. And I walked away from that, and you can see the blank looks on the executives' faces. And, and you know, he kind of said, well, that's the last time you're going to invite me back. And uh, I said, well, just give it some time. So I put it away to the side. Remember, at this point, I'm an ROA, ROI, ROU, ROME guy, OK? And I figured, well, we'll see what happens. That was an interesting day. Learned a lot about Walmart. About six months later, a group came to me. And they said, John, we've been thinking about what Doug told us. And we think we have an idea on how to proceed. And so I'm going to show you how we proceeded and what that got us. It got us to a very, very interesting place because we just let the thing fertilize. The steps to cultural transformation. When you're a journalist, you are told that you are going to write a story, and in the first paragraph, you need to do the who, what, where, when, why, and how. Anyone familiar with that? Good. OK, right? OK. You wouldn't believe how many stories don't have that anymore. It just makes me crazy. So change, right? Um, I'm going to talk about who, what, why, and how. OK? And I'm going to talk to you about this in a different way. I'm going to talk to you about how we did our journey. Some of this stuff I think you're going to be very familiar with. What I want you to think about is not so much the content, although if the content's interesting, please do. I also want you to take in how we communicate it, OK? Because communication, if you're coaching, is almost as important as the content that you are trying to communicate, OK? 
You guys know this guy. You guys mentioned him this morning. I'm so interested in the why, Mitch, in terms of what you guys are doing. Um, uh, we discovered this guy. I met this guy at one of these, these TED things, and he kind of blew me away. And so I started doing things on um, uh, the internet and prowling again, browsing. And I've decided that when you get stuck, just go to YouTube, OK? I'm going to show you a two and a half minute video. I'm sure most of you have seen this, but I want you to think about using it with 17,000 people and what it says. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. That is the fundamental premise of 21st century business. I am telling you right now, that's the core of this movement. They buy why you do it. So then the hard part is, so what's our purpose, okay? Back to my friend from Walmart. So we internalized this, and we showed this to about everyone we possibly could show at our company. And here is basically the thought process that uh, Simon uh, outlined there. Why, how, what? And then here's how Apple thought about it. Thinking differently, making things easy. And oh, we make computers and smartphones and all kinds of stuff. And if you listen to the press, they're starting to talk about purpose-driven companies all over the place, but for not the right reasons. They think it's a marketing ploy, like Steve challenged me on. It's not about marketing, okay? It helps your marketing. I'll show you that at the end. It really helps your marketing, but it's not about the marketing. It's about a much higher calling than that. And I loved Andrew's chart. It's much better than mine again. Um, uh, companies that are purpose-driven do better in the marketplace because they execute better. And I can speak 100% with conviction from that because my company is doing much better since we started doing this. So what Doug did for us was a group came to me and said, John, uh, we think Doug's onto something and we would like to propose that we do uh, a, a mission, vision, values thing. I went, okay, fine. What's the ROI on that? And this was the vision that they did for us. 
However you want to say it, wherever you want to share it, we're the one to come for for just the right words, artworks, artwork, and stories. We're diverse, talented, and engaged. Admired for our innovation and creative culture. People are at the heart of everything. We never said that before. People are at the heart of everything we do, and we work to make the world a more thoughtful and caring place every single day. Did you know something? Our business is about ideas. All those cards that you have, okay, there ain't no computer in the world that can write those cards, okay? Our intellectual property walks out of our building every day, okay? I cannot automate our processes. Without people who are engaged, we have no business. So people are at the heart of everything we do. That is something that our associates intrinsically understand. Our values. This is so well done. I mean, the graphics on this, I mean, I'm so proud of our company. Our graphics, I mean, they must have spent a month getting the graphics right. Creativity, innovation, collaboration, success, and people. And we always treat our people with respect. So we have all of this, and uh, um, my team comes to me, and they said, John, we are lacking a mission statement. Now, my company's history is we've been owned by a, a family for 110 years, OK? The great-grandsons of the founders were the two chairmen, vice chairmen, that type of thing in, in our company at the time. And uh, they, they really do, did understand. They do understand the heart and soul of our company. Um, but we needed a mission statement. And I wanted a mission statement that the associates would understand, our culture would embrace, and most, more as important, not most, but as important is that the family would embrace. And this is where the story gets a little out of control. Okay, so I uh, said, okay, we need a mission statement. And so they said, so how are we gonna do that, John? And I said, we're gonna have, and you'll meet them in a minute here, Zev and Jeff write the mission statement. Okay. Zev and Jeff aren't like what I would call writer type people, okay? So they said, how are you gonna do that, John? So I uh, got Zev and Jeff together and I said, hey, let's have lunch. We're gonna talk about some stuff today. So I have lunch and like plastic things brought into this little conference room and we sit down in the conference room and Zev and Jeff say, hey, there are only two lunches here. You're not having lunch, John? And I said, no, I'm not. And they go, well, what are we gonna do? And I said, well, you two are gonna have lunch and uh, you're not gonna leave the room until you write a mission statement for me based on these beliefs and values. And I got up and I locked the room. <laughs> Luckily, they're very good friends of mine. I don't know if I'd have gotten away with that with some other guys. And so Zev and Jeff, and I went and sat across the hall, okay, while they were writing their, their mission statements, okay. About 10 minutes later, they jiggled the door, and they couldn't get out, and I go, hope they don't have to go to the bathroom because they're not leaving. And uh, they knocked on the door, and Jeff goes, John, we're done. 10 minutes after all of this. Here's what they wrote. Um, you do my business as long as I do, 30-some years. You know when it's good like that. I know when an ad's good, I know when a card's good, I know, I looked at that and I said, we're done. And they go, you wanna edit it? I go, no, you wrote it, we're done, okay? Our company has taken this and run with it. Everywhere I go, I have people, we don't say regards anymore or sincerely on letters, people write HLL comma, okay? Um, I was impressed today, all the cards that we uh, passed out were, were sent in our shipping boxes and our shipping boxes Someone in our distribution centers, I guess, we now deliver happiness, laughter, and love, okay? Um, you, it's on the walls as you walk into our building, a giant happiness, laughter, and love. It has become the calling of the company. It has become our purpose. It has become the central icon on what we're doing, and amazing things, crazy things have happened since we did that, all because I locked them in a room for 10 minutes and wouldn't let them out until they write me a mission statement. <laughs> I want you to meet Zev and Jeff a little bit here. You'll get a better feeling for this. And what I'm gonna do is I got a three minute and 10 second video. By the way, you know why I always give you the times? Because I don't want you thinking I'm holding you hostage to a 20 minute video, so you can kind of brace yourself. I got a three minute and 10 second video here that is uh, Zev and Ze Jeff and a couple of our key leaders talking about this when we rolled it out. To me, the mission is what drives us. The mission is what we wake up to do every day. The vision is where we're heading. 
something that gives us our compass and sets our direction of where we want to be seven, eight years from now. Values start to give you some more specifics as to the kinds of behaviors that we want to drive within our business. For a creative company like American Greetings, there are going to be values that are very unique to us. This year is really a defining year for us as a company. Today we're the leader within the industry and we have to make sure that our vision, our mission, our values properly portray where we're going and who we want to be. The best way to create a mission, vision, and value statement was really to reach out to every single associate. Everyone that essentially exists under the American Greetings umbrella is part of the mission, vision, values. We had lots of tools in place for the organization to participate in. They could write, they could illustrate. We came up with an idea where we would create these templates. We used a very fun, whimsical look to those templates. In order to reflect the sort of culture, we wanted a template that, that was inspiring. So that we could see what they felt was important about AG today and where they wanted to see AG in the future. What I was most amazed about was the amount of feedback that we got from associates all around the world. As a writing team, that became a challenge because we really tried to capture the voice of all that input into the actual language of the document. We want it to be a statement that reflects who we are and is very inclusive. We want it to be about who we are and about what we do. And what we do is we create happiness, laughter, and love. Today, more than ever, having the entire company aligned behind the mission of the business and having a clear view of where the vision is going to be so that we're all pulling in the same direction is absolutely critical. I think each of us need to integrate them into everything that we're doing. If someone asks you what you do at American Greetings, you want them to essentially say the mission. And we want them to say that because it's inside them and they believe in it, not because we tell them to say it. And in the end of the day, I'm showing up for work every day to create happiness, laughter, and love, and that's not bad at all. Isn't that nice? I have a, we have a great ad agency. They didn't do that, okay? Uh, we have an internal group, just a couple of people, and uh, our rule is make it great. Whatever you want to do, just communicate what we want to do. So that was done internally on a shoestring, okay? Um, just, just awesome. It, 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 it's so rewarding to work for a creative company like that. So that's how we communicated, like, why all this was happening to our associates. And that was about six, seven years ago. That, that, was, that is not um, a recent video. Our golden circle is why we're going to make the world a more thoughtful and caring place. We're going to help build people build meaningful connections, and we're going to do that with greeting cards, gift wrap, and whatever. Everyone has grabbed that purpose. So, I've talked about why, how, and what. Isn't that interesting? That's kind of like how Simon organizes it, okay? The hardest part of this is the who, because the who is all over the place, and I want to talk about that for a couple of minutes. We um, began by trying to communicate for the outside world what our purpose was in kind of a more directive way. And so on the back of every one of our business cards, and Mark, this one's for you. So I promised you a business card. It says on the back, we make the world a more thoughtful and caring place. Everybody who ha passes out a business card from American Greetings uh, will share our purpose with who they are dealing with. When you are me, okay, and you're the CEO of a company, you're responsible for all the constituencies of your company. And I don't think people think a lot or enough about this who question. So let me talk about my constituencies for a couple of minutes, because that's very important when you coach, OK? Uh, my most important constituency is my customers, OK? That's part of my job responsibility, is kind of making sure that we're aligned for them. For me, the second most important constituency is our associates or our employees, um, because our IP walks out the door every day. Third is the ownership of the company. Uh, we used to be publicly owned, now we're privately owned. So my ownership has changed over time. Fourth constituency are the suppliers. And I call my bankers suppliers, okay? The bankers who lend to us, they're just suppliers of money. So I treat them like that. Um, as long as you pay your loans and don't break your covenants, you're gonna be okay. So um, 
And finally, fifth, and this is really important, I think too many CEOs forget this, and I think this is the core of the movement here, is your community. Your community is everywhere we operate. It is uh, the people we touch in our stores. It is what we do public relations wise uh, 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 representing our company. So it's customers, employees, ownership, suppliers, and community. I've got to have a 360 degree communication plan for all of those folks or we're not going to be effective in implementing our purpose. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a couple minutes and let me digress. Change ahead again, okay. This is a famous picture. This is Steve Jobs rolling out the iPhone in 2007. If you haven't seen his rollout of the iPhone, it would be really informative. If you want to know how the world has changed just in the 11, last 11 years, put the uh, YouTube up of him rolling out the iPhone at iMac, okay, in 2007. It's amazing what the thing has developed versus what his original vision is. And you can see kind of the change happening in our world around us. You know we check our phones 150 times a day? I think that's light, okay? My daughter, I don't know if this is smart, my daughter sleeps with her cell phone under her pillow. Okay, I'm sure, do other people do that? Okay, oh, good, good. I've told her, like, put it to the side. So, 87% um, always have their smartphone at their side day and night, okay? I believe that completely. Well, people are communicating on these smartphones, and that is really threatening to my business if you look at it as a challenge. But if you are a great salesperson, you think of it as a opportunity. And that's where the millennials come in, because they're the big smartphone uh, user leaders uh, in, in the world. Um, uh, they have dramatically different buying behaviors. They are now the largest consumers of greeting cards. Did you know that? More greeting cards are sold to millennials than anyone else in the world, including the United States. Isn't that a surprise? Uh, they believe about access, not ownership. They're multicultural. Uh, they account for nearly one third of all CPG spending, which is Walmart and food stores and all that, consumer packaged goods. They're really important to us. They have destroyed the newspaper business. They just don't understand why you need to waste all of this paper. Okay, I can just read it on my iPad. And there are 75 million of them. They're the most educated. They have different values. They have social media. They make a difference. And I put that in yellow because this is the most important thing to our business. They write. Think about those greeting cards that you have right now. Every one of them is going to have to be written. And what we are finding is the millennials are using greeting cards as their alternative to social media. No one wants to be a Facebook friend. Everyone wants to be a special friend. And so when it's a good friend's birthday and you're part of her inner circle, you're going to want to do something different than just put a post up on her Facebook wall that says HBD. And what we are finding is they go to Target, they go to Walmart, they go to grocery stores, they go on the internet, they buy greeting cards. If you walk into a Target uh, store, particularly between like 10.30 and 1.30, I guarantee you you're going to find one woman sitting in the Starbucks coffee shop carefully going through her now $8 card. Can you believe that? Those cards we gave you are like eight bucks a throw. I never thought I'd see that in my career. Um, carefully going through it and practicing what she's going to write on that card because that card is a gift. It's not a communication to the millennials. So we've rethought how we do it, and that's why all the cards are so fancy because they want to give the gift of their words. And they are much more articulate than their mothers were in writing greeting cards because they have all this practice with the texts, with the Facebook, with the blogging. And oh, by the way, I don't think it's stuff their English teachers are going to like a lot. I mean, if you look at the language, OK? But it's very, it means a lot to them. That's why our business is uh, going to transition into the new generation. OK, but they're not going to buy stuff from you if you don't have a purpose. It matters to them. They believe companies that they buy from need to have a sense of purpose. They need to believe that companies give back to society. We have to offer more ways to share their opinions, and they're interested in helping products who have products and services to do that. Ergo, not only do we have to create a purpose for our company, we have to create a purpose for our consumers. That's why you have to have the 360 degree writing. So what we did was we said, OK, we create happiness, laughter, and love is great for us, but what do we tell people who work with us? So we moved to a new city last year, a couple years ago, with our new headquarters, and I had to meet with the mayor, and the mayor sits there, and he goes, 
So what do you guys do? Oh, great. Um, we make greeting cards. Instead, I didn't say that. I said, our goal is to make the world a more thoughtful and caring place. And he went, wow. Welcome to Westlake. Nice to have you. End the conversation. You wouldn't believe how that unlocks opportunity with any constituency that you got to deal with uh, uh, in your company's way. The why of the business. So this thing has found its way uh, into our benefits program. Everything we have is now, quote, branded with the purpose of the company. By the way, that creates special obligations on me and the management team because now when we do a health care program, we roll out our benefits every year, they better reflect that value, that they're thoughtful and caring. So we have all kinds of things. By the way, our health care benefits, our increases are less than uh, average for the last six years now, I think. We're, we're trailing the average in terms of what we're charging for health care because we have created an obligation on ourselves to make sure that we're thoughtful and caring not only for our associates but for their families as well. Okay, so here's Mr. where Mr. ROI, ROA guy comes in again. I'm going to tell you another story. Um, this is where it gets out of control. Okay, so we got all this good stuff going. The company's running. We're gaining market share in the marketplace. We're making tons of money. We never thought we were. The old industrial General Motors of greeting cards is kind of turning into this millennial greeting card machine, okay? We're all starting to row together, okay? We're all very balanced. I'm sharing you stuff that, that I show our associates. And we have a new slogan for our operating guys, better beats best. I stole that from the Blue Angels. I didn't say that. Um, uh, and that seemed to have caught fire in the company. So the family, being the family, goes, John, this is really great. We really like the way the company is going. We've got this great idea. And I go, awesome. What's your great idea? Well, being an ROA, ROI, ROU, ROME guy, I don't like things getting carried away, you know, systematic. It, keeps things under control. So they said, uh, you know, um, we would like to transform the company permanently into this. Okay, how are we gonna do that? We're gonna build a building. We're gonna build a new headquarters building for American Greetings that's gonna do this. And I go, great. We've already hired the architects. It's gonna be 600,000 square feet. That's big, guys. That's like, that's like out of control big. Um, uh, we think we can do it for about $100 million. Really, $100 million for a building. Yeah, we're going to build it fit for purpose. We're going to let the creative people work all over the building in all kinds of places. And we're going to create like a town square where everyone can gather. And we're going to encourage collaboration. And we believe that a caffeinated company is a productive company. So we're putting coffee everywhere in the thing. We have like the world's biggest Starbucks in our building. Um, and we're going to lock this culture in, OK? So I'm going to show you something. I want, to, I want to take you to the building for about three and a half minutes and show you what it is. And, and you'll get the feel for what we're doing. This is what we did at the completion of the building at the grand opening for basically all of the politicians in Ohio who um, had to get a zoning permits and all this kind of stuff. But it, it kind of describes what happens when you push. I didn't plan on building a new building. I didn't plan on having my boxes with happiness, laughter, and love. This thing just kind of took off on its own. By the way, the family did this. decorated the entire building itself. I'll talk about the center court when we're done. We named it the Creative Studios because we didn't want to have a headquarters anymore. And then suddenly I'm wide awake. This is our town square, shops and coffee shops. Oh, 
We actually studied Frank Lloyd Wright's SC Johnson headquarters to design our furniture. So, so, a, so a little mission statement written in a room over lunch turned itself into something that institutionalized, basically cemented our culture for the next uh, 40 or 50 years. Let me talk about the center court for a minute. This is uh, back to do what you say, say what you do, follow through. So uh, Jeff Weiss made the uh, profound mistake of surveying the creative folks and asking them what they would like in a new building. Big mistake. Told them that, but he said, that's okay. And so they said they wanted direct sunlight. Okay, that didn't seem like too outrageous a demand. So um, to get direct sunlight into our, our creative people, we were gonna need 87% of the floor space having access to windows, which is difficult in a large 600,000 square foot office building. Ergo, the donut, architectural trick. If you put a donut in, you can get light in from both sides, okay? That little park with all those cool little chairs in it is on the third floor of our building. There is actually a lawn that we have put on the roof, and I can't tell you what the hydronics, hydronics are on keeping that lawn watered, okay? Our $100 million building turned into about $130 million building. We spent $30 million so Jeff could follow through on his promise of direct sunlight. The building is gorgeous. Absolutely spectacular. And that is a building built for purpose, built for our purpose. And in architectural terms, they call it fit for purpose. They just don't know quite what we meant when we said purpose. That's a happiness, laughter, and love building. And that's a building that's going to be great for a greeting card company for a long, long time to come. Cool, cool things have happened. We haven't been able to recruit uh, young millennials to Cleveland. Does that surprise you guys? So. Um, uh, the best artists in our business right now are mostly between 25 and 40, and we try to get them to come to Cleveland, and they go, really? Okay, hey, I'll, work, I'll work remotely. But we don't get half of the value from the artists if they're not sitting with us every day. So we started, uh, once we got the building up, we started bringing them there. We have like an 80% acceptance rate from people wanting to move to Cleveland now. And we show them where we are, the shopping center that we are a part of, the housing around it. All of a sudden, we have become really hip. And it has really helped the business, and that's the beginning of the second leg of, of what we're doing. So, I could talk about who all day. I'm going to make one more uh, uh, um, story here, and I'm going to share with you one more thing that absolutely emerged from all of this, okay? And it was a complete transformation of my company's um, raison d'etre, reason for being. We were really a consumer company, but we weren't much of a marketing company. And so we challenged ourselves, how do we reach the millennials going forward? And we brought in an advertising guy, the guy who did uh, Flow for Progressive, Alex Ho. We hired him to be our advertising guy, and he says, you don't do TV, not in this business. We're going to do all internet and all that. And I go, great. So, um, so Alex um, uh, came to me, and I was at a meeting one day, and he says, so John, we want to do like our first real big advertising campaign. And I go, okay. And uh, I have some experience in advertising at Hallmark over the years, so I kind of like knew how this worked. And he came to me and says, here's our, here's our brief, which is what you do for an ad. You kind of design a brief so the creative people can execute to it. Here's our brief. And it was a want ad. And I go, okay. And he goes, so that's our brief. And he goes, can we shoot it? 
And I go, how much is it going to cost? You always ask that. And he goes, $600,000. That's a lot of money. How long is the ad going to be? Four and a half minutes. Now, if, I don't know if you know advertising, but most ads are like 30 seconds or a minute. Four and a half minutes, really. OK. Um, it's going to be great, John. Well, part of our culture is, and our vision statement is, we trust our people. So I said, $600,000 for an ad, for, for an advertisement we're going to do off a of one ad. OK, I got it. So he went off and shot the ad. They brought me in to review the ad. That was nice, the day before we put it up on the air. Um, <laughs> and they go, and Alex and, and Christy Caprosi, you saw on this other video, said, so what do you think? And I looked at it. And once again, if you're in the business long enough, you know it when you see it. And I looked at it, and I said, wow. You guys are going to con. Alex knew what that meant. Christy went, huh? Because she hadn't had a lot of experience with advertising. So what we did is we designed an advertising campaign that was going to be what we call a modern marketing approach. We invented brands for millennials, built from our purpose. OK, we did this advertising. You know what the Effies are? They're like the big, they're the Oscars of advertising. We won every Effie you could win. We sat right next to Procter & Gamble. They actually invited me to this. They never invite me to anything, but they invited me to this. I was so. <laughs> I was so pleased. The Procter & Gamble guys were sitting next to us having done some like $200 million advertising campaign. So they thought they were going to win all these awards. And they had the grand effie for the best ad of the year. And they're all kind of getting off stage and get their, their Oscar or whatever they were going to do. And we're just sitting right next to them. Like, we had no idea. And they said, the winner of the grand effie is, and the Procter & Gamble guys are already up, uh, American Greetings. And everyone goes, what? So what happened was our advertising group grabbed the happiness, laughter, and love, vision of what we did, the idea that creative is driven from our associates, and they created something truly remarkable in advertising that we've actually been able to reproduce four or five times. And it has really, really helped our company. And I thought I would show you the odd ad. You may have seen this. I hope you have. It is like the most popular ad every Mother's Day. OK? Just give me one second. Thank sure. you. Sorry. Uh-huh. Two minutes. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Sorry about hey, that. Hey, Hi, nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Have you ever done one of these interviews uh, over the camera before? No. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the job to get started with. It's not just um, a job. It's sort of probably the most important job. Uh, the title that we have going right now is Director of Operations, but it's really kind of so much more than that. Responsibilities and requirements are, are really quite extensive. Uh, first category for the requirements would be mobility. This job requires that you must be able to work standing up most or really all of the time, uh, constantly on your feet, constantly bending over, constantly exerting yourself, a high level of stamina. Uh, uh, okay. That's a lot. For how many, like, for how many hours? Uh, 135 hours to unlimited hours a week. It's basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm sure you'll have a chance from time to time to maybe just sit down here and there, yeah? Uh, you mean like a break? Yeah. Uh, no, there are no breaks available. Is, th is that even legal? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. OK, yeah. so like no lunch? You can or... have lunch, but only when the associate is done eating their lunch. Uh. I think that's a little intense. No, no not possible. That's crazy. Now, this position requires excellent negotiation and interpersonal skill. We're really looking for someone that might have a degree in uh, medicine, in finance, and the culinary arts. You must be able to wear several hats. Associate needs constant attention. Sometimes they have to stay up with an associate throughout the night. Being able to work in a chaotic environment, if you, if you had a life, we'd ask you to sort of give that life up. No vacations. In fact, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and holidays, the workload is going to go up, and we demand that with, with a happy disposition. Uh, that's almost cruel. <laughs> that's almost uh, a very, very sick, twisted joke. But when there's time to sleep or? Oh, no time to sleep. Yeah, all-encompassing, all almost. That's exactly right. 365 days a year? Yes. No, that's, that's inhumane. That's, that's very insane. The meaningful connections that you make and the, the feeling that you get from really helping your associate are immeasurable. Also, let's cover the salary. The position is going to pay absolutely nothing. Excuse me? No. Nobody's doing that for free. Yeah, pro bono. <laughs> Completely for free. <laughs> no! What if I told you there's someone that actually currently uh, holds this position right now? 
Billions of people, actually. Who? Moms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Moms. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and they meet every requirement, oh, don't wow. they? Oh my god. Moms are the best! Yeah, there's no pay. They're 24 hours. They're always there. Now I'm thinking about my mom. Yeah, and what are you thinking about her? I'm thinking about all those nights and everything. Thank you so much for everything you do. I know it doesn't seem like I appreciate all of it, but I definitely do. So, Mom, I want to say thank you for everything that you've done. I love you very much. You've been there through thick and thin. My mom is just awesome. She's awesome. For all you coaches out there, here's the lesson, okay? If they had told me they were gonna make a four and a half minute ad, that they were only gonna run on the internet, they were gonna spend $600,000 on the thing and the brief was an, uh, a help wanted ad, okay? I'd have told you, no blanking way we're gonna do that, okay? But because I had been properly coached, we had enough momentum in our culture around what we were doing, around our purpose and our why, okay? My advertising person said, this is exactly the type of thing that we need to be doing. We did the ad. There are 67 ads in the Advertising Hall of Fame. In September, this will be number 68. Remember the little beetle ad? And this from a company that has continually competed with a competitor who does all the advertising. First time out, we did that. The rest of the advertising is just as strong. Uh, but that's what culture will do for you. And that's when you start seeing your transformation getting traction. So let me tie this up. OK. By the way, you'll notice the logo is different here, all lowercase. OK. We went and told the family that we we're changing the logo. They told me the last four people who tried to change the logo are no longer with the company. Um, and I said, but if you are all caps on your logo, you're basically screaming at them on the internet. <laughs> oh, OK, change the logo. But that's, that's what happens, and that's the type of thing that starts happening when your company starts trusting itself. The associates trust the company, management trusts the associates, and you get that <laughs> virtuous circle starting. So six points I want to make. The world's changing at an accelerating pace, OK? Uh, purpose, the why, helps you manage it. It is so important going forward. I believe purpose is the movement of productivity in the 21st century businesses, and I think you are right at the front of this. Agility, resilience, engagement, create productivity for you, your colleagues, your team, and your company. If you're a coach, you have to tell everyone who's a decision maker, that's what the formula is. You can take the meanest, toughest, industrial company, and you can transform it if you find the right why. We have a container company who did this this morning, and you have a creative greeting card company talking this afternoon. You can't have two companies farther apart on the poles of the types of uh, businesses that we have. If you make yourself available, this is what you need to coach your leaders. If you make yourself available, if you make yourself vulnerable to listen, vulnerable to listen. A lot of executives will listen, sort of, but they're really not vulnerable. They're not really listening. If you make yourself vulnerable to listen, you might be surprised by the outcomes like you might end up with an advertising program that you didn't think you were going to get. However you articulate this love thing works, every company will adapt it in a different way. It is not about sexual harassment, OK? <laughs> it is about the productivity of your business. And I am absolutely convinced that this purpose, this why, the leap, is the anecdote. It's the anecdote to the poisonous change that is running across our culture right now. And I think it will ameliorate most of the fear that we see in a lot of the people that we work with. Anyway, thank you for listening. I do appreciate it. I think I'm just going to stand. Is that good? Okay, good.
All right. Um, thank you. So we're, we, uh, we've got a few minutes before we take a break for uh, any, any questions, comments, concerns, or emotional outbursts. Lodine, your, your hand went up so fast I, I could barely see it. So can we get a microphone over here? So first, thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. And um, I want to thank you also for being a leader that listens to your people. I think that of all the messages that I've heard here today, the one thing that stands out is the listening part from the executives because I know at my company, uh, they don't listen. I told all my leaders I was coming to this today mm -hmm. and then right before this weekend and right before I left, I asked all of them if they uh, remembered what I said about the leadership thing that I was going, I called it a leadership thing because that's kind of how I felt they heard it. And none of them could tell me what I told them. Mm -hmm. And my manager, my direct manager, I gave him um, kind of a printout of the, the experience itself. And the reason I know he wasn't listening was because he left it on the table in the room that we were meeting in. And I put it on his keyboard and he still didn't know. He, asked, he sent me an email, in fact, yesterday that said, can you let me know where you, where you are and what you're doing? And I responded back, seriously? I told you not once, but twice, and then I attached what I, what I gave him, and I said, but it's clear to me that you weren't listening when I explained it. Yeah. So to hear that today is just like, I want to be, I actually said out loud, I want to work for American Greetings, because I'd rather be in an environment where, where everyone's like-minded than to be kind of not. Thank you. So thank you for that. That's fantastic. Should have left him a card. <laughs> Please. Wait for the microphone. Okay. You guys are doing so good with the microphones. Hi, I'm Carrie. How Hi, are you Carrie. guys doing? Uh, so what I realized, we have so many things in common. Uh, one of the things that really stands out with this whole group is we're all evangelists mm -hmm. together for bringing love in the workplace. And one of the things I was intrigued by was the fact that you were not a believer at all. So what I'm interested in knowing, because this will help me be a better evangelist, is for someone that didn't believe in this at all, what was the tipping point in getting you to change your mind, your mindset on this? How people were reacting to it. So, so uh, it started really slow. So don't let me think like this was some kind of spontaneous, I mean, it started really slow. And when it started, I was just, I just put it to the side and I just kind of let it develop in the organization. And, you know, I was ROA, ROIing it. So I was not like, like getting into the cultural thing. And then I started people responding to it. And um, so um, Zev, who is a very, very, uh, uh, he's not the most emotional guy in the world. Okay, he's a sweet, sweet guy, but he just doesn't get worked up about stuff. He started talking about happiness, laughter, and love. We have these all associate meetings. We're the only company I know of with 17,000 employees who still has all company meetings. So, I mean, it's crazy what we do. Um, we, we try to be a small company still. And uh, Zev started crying. Then everyone else started crying in the audience. And that was like, like, you saw people reacting to this and how it was motivating them. And then I started getting all these notes with HLL on it. And then, you know, I see the distribution guys putting it on the darn boxes, and you could just see that it was getting traction. And then what you want to do is just not get in the way of people. And by the way, that made me a better executive because uh, I got more and more, I don't want to say disengaged with what was going on, but I was like like letting the, the company breathe a little bit in terms of what we were doing, like making a $600,000 ad without seeing anything, okay? And it was kind of like, well, it's on me if it doesn't work, but you want to know something? The way things are going around here right now, it's probably going to work great. I just didn't realize it was going to work as great as it is. They start slow. They gain momentum. Okay, you have to give your leaders the patience to, to, to think about it. And I have my good days and my bad days listening. Uh, my guys will tell you that. Some days I'm really good, and some days I'm like not as good as I could be. Um, uh, and we're also a very polite company, so we, like, we don't leave paper behind in the conference room. So I, I would grab it, and then throw it away. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, so I don't think there was one tipping point. It was more of a, oh my gosh, this is really resonating with people. And that's when we knew we had it. So. And, and it, hey, we get the microphone this way. So, and it also strikes me that you know, listening, we tend to interpret listening in the very kind of literal sense. You're telling me something, I'm hearing you, I can repeat it, I know where you're gonna be because you told me. 
you guys do this amazing, massive organizational listening mm -hmm. to the tune of $30 million. Yeah. When people say we want natural light, that's like a, where's Mitch? That's like a $30 million ice machine. Is what that is. <laughs> right? That's what that is. It better be crunchy. And that is, I mean, that is a <laughs> crunchy ice machine. That is full on organizational. Not just listening, but listening with the desire to fulfill what it is that you're hearing. And that's, that's very powerful. Let's, let's do one more before we take our break. Hey, Mark. <laughs> John and I worked together probably 20 years ago. Can you hold the microphone a little closer? And John was uh, in, in development, came through on a rotation through the finance department. Yeah. Our company was run by a Ford CFO, and we were very financially focused. And yeah. John would come down with all his energy on what was called the fifth floor. Yeah. And we had a budget meeting that's a multi-million dollar budget and John was in there and he was uh, being John we had all these finance people in there and we were talking about the numbers and John mentioned you know this is about people's families and their livelihood and we have a moral obligation to these people and I'm just listening to what you're saying right now and thinking you, you sound like you're a hard guy up there but you're you've had this for a long time oh, thank it, you I walked out of that meeting a different person because I listened to what you said actually I thought about that before I came thank you that's Thank beautiful. You. Thunderous applause. All right. Yeah. One more. Let's see if we start and then we'll, we'll, go to, we'll go to you too, Rachel. One sec. So what I saw demonstrated today was not just with you, but especially with you, was the importance of connecting the head and the heart. Because I've watched speakers come up here. I've watched people brought to tears. And I know that one of the things is we're afraid to show our hearts. We're afraid to show our feelings, but that was undeniable. We could not not feel that, so I want to thank you immensely for that. And I also got the best hug from my grandson. I'm <laughs> hey, uh, let, Jordan, Jordan, can you take that over here to Rachel? Raise, raise your hand, and we'll finish with this before we take our break. Hello, my name is Rachel. I have the privilege of working in that building that you saw and creating happiness, laughter, and love every single day. Um, so I wanted to tell you guys about a few things. It's John has definitely sent the president for our company and that meaningful connections, not just out when somebody gets a greeting card and gives it to somebody, but between our colleagues. Um, it doesn't matter what level you are. One, it is a million percent impossible to walk through those doors, regardless of how your morning has started, and not be in a good mood when you get there. It's impossible. Um, the building is generates an energy that is so exhilarating, whether you're having a meeting about some struggles that might be happening in your department or situation, or whether you're coming up and creating new ideas. So it's a really amazing place to be. Um, the other thing is, he mentioned the 17,000 employees. And myself and Brian and Melissa, we work in the largest part of American Greetings, where we have about 10,000 uh, merchandisers and then our managers and things like that. So one of the things that we've done, which has been so great to give everybody a voice, we have these all-hand meetings through a thing called Pigeonhole. And our leadership is so great because they're always open to say, you ask anything you want to. And if I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't, um, I'll let you know I don't know the answer. And if I know it and I can't tell you, I'll let you know I know it and I can't tell you. So it's just an amazing place to work and open communication and the meaningful connections are not just through the greeting cards, but through all of us that walk through the door. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Thunderous applause for John Peter. Thank you very much. That's what we call a double standing L, man. Thank you for listening to another episode of Love is Just Damn Good Business with Steve Farber. Join us again next time because when customer and employee satisfaction just isn't enough anymore, we are here to back you up with specific ideas to operationalize love to make an enormous difference in your business, personal life, and the world around you. Visit our website at stevefarber.com to leave a review. And don't forget to share the love with your colleagues and friends because after all, 
It's just damn good business.